Well, it is so good to be back together again, uh, another ministry year, and here is the problem. We have no room. So everybody, I just need y'all to move in. If you've got a seat between you, I just want you to just give that up to somebody else who's waiting in the back to come in. And next weekend, they'll be on time and we won't have to do that. <laughs> hey, let me just call our hearts and minds to the Lord's word for just a quick moment before we continue to sing. Look up here, let's give God's word our full attention right now. It says this, oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with a song of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea, it is his, he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God and maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. I don't know about you, but I want to worship the Lord with my whole heart. Like I didn't, I didn't sign up for Jesus just to kind of show up to church, hands in pockets, and just kind of sing where I feel like I want to sing. I signed up for Jesus because I believe he is it. He's the only way that my life will ever count for anything. And so when I sing, I want the song that is in my heart that he's put there to be propor proportionate to the salvation in which he saved me, right? So when we sing, we call on the Lord like the psalmist. He's reminding us, come. Remember all the benefits you have in Jesus. Christian, remember what he has saved you from and then worship him. Don't just sing a little, sing with all your heart, with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, with all your strength. The Bible calls us to that. And we can know that his spirit that is sealed within us will give us the strength to do just that. So let's do that through this song together. We want the Lord to have our whole heart, a holistic view of worship before the King knowing that he hears every word. Let's lift this up to him. Help us, Lord, this morning. We just want to meet with you, Jesus. We just want you to be glorified. Use these songs, we pray. If I have breath, if I have love, I'll bring you in, offering you a worthy of. Let it be pure, let it be true. I'm not giving anything less to you. I give my whole life and my whole
Jesus. Jesus, that is why we've gathered to love you and obey you with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, and our whole strength. And Lord, you use these songs as ways just to remind us of how good we have it in you. The blessings that you have poured out, the characteristics of the God we serve. How could we not love you more? How could we not want to surrender again to the will of Jesus Christ? Would you, Spirit, do that work in us today? Would you give us just such a passion and love and desire to see the kingdom of God advanced and the glory of God to be made known in and through each of our lives? Meet with us today, this morning. May your word be proclaimed and may our hearts be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, let's be seated together. Amen. Well, good morning, Christ Church. And I am just going to reiterate what Josh said as he was playing. If there are some empty seats near you, scoot in toward the middle. This is like an overbooked flight. You know how they come on and they say, every seat is full. So let's scoot in. Make sure that any seats that are available are available to people who are waiting for seats. Well, it is Awesome to see all of you as we all kind of come back from being gone over the summer and we all gather back together. It's so encouraging to gather together like this. And if, if you are a part of our church family, you know what to do, or maybe you've been gone all summer and so you've kind of forgotten this part of the service, pull out your phone and go to the Christ Church app and go to the dashboard where you can fill out the communication card. Let us know that you are here and let us know how we can be praying for you. But while you're in the dashboard, because we're getting rolling into the fall, there are going to be all kinds of things in there that are curated for you of ways that you can get involved more at Christ Church. So be sure to look through that app and see all those opportunities. And guess, if this is your first week with us, I just wanna welcome you. My name is Stefan. I am on staff here at Christ Church, and I hope you are able to stop by the guest tent on your way in, though if you didn't because it was too hot, I don't blame you for just coming in. But there is a free gift for you if this is your first week. And in that free gift, there is a guest card. And if you could fill out that guest card, if you have it, and you can put it in any of the black offering boxes around or near the exits, or you can just take out your phone and you can scan the QR code and then you'll be able to fill that out and someone from the church will reach out to you to answer any questions that you have. And if you're joining us on live stream, I wanna welcome you as well. And if you're a part of our church family and you're just not able to be with us this weekend, we're so glad that you can at least join online and we look forward to seeing you in person very soon. But if this is the first time that you're engaging with Christ Church, you can text get info to 94000 and someone will reach out to you to answer any questions that you have. And as we are rolling into the fall, if you've been here for a little while and you want to get involved in deeper discipleship at Christ Church, you should attend our next Consider, which is happening next weekend, the 12th and the 13th. One is happening after the Saturday service and the other is happening during this service over in the Connect Room. And this is a time where you're able to ask questions, talk to leaders in the church, hear about the church and ways to get involved more. So if you would like to attend that, consider. Be sure to RSVP on the app. Let us know that you're coming so that we can be ready for you. If you have kids, that's okay. They can stay in the kids' ministry and they will be well taken care of over there. And you can learn how you can get involved deeper at Christ Church. And for all of us, whether you've only been here for a few weeks or maybe this is your first week or you've been here for 10 years, our ministry kickoff is starting next week where we are launching all of the various discipleship opportunities in the church. We have studies, we have soul care groups, we have community groups, including our very first Spanish speaking community group. So there are opportunities for you to engage in deeper discipleship this fall. And if I can just implore you, whether you have engaged in discipleship before or you've never really moved beyond a weekend service in your involvement at the church, let me just implore you, let this season be the one where you push forward in your discipleship by getting engaged in studies, community groups, and soul care groups. Well, our last announcement this morning is for our City Hope Center. And the item of the month for City Hope is toothbrushes and toothpaste both of them because one is not very helpful without the other. <laughs> so we wanna make sure to bring toothpaste and toothbrushes and drop them off in the City Hope donation bin in the lobby so that those in need can get what they need. So next time you're at the grocery store, remember this, grab a few extra and bring them the next time that you're here so that we can continue to support the work at City Hope. 
Well, as we continue in our worship, we do so through gifts and offerings. And we, we don't give because we have something great that God needs from us. Instead, we give because God is great and has given to us. And so let's take this time and consecrate these gifts before the Lord together. God, we thank you that you are not a God who is distant and unknowable. You are a God who is near. And you are not a God who takes, but a God who gives. And so Lord, as you have given so richly through the finished work of your son, Jesus, reconciling us to yourself and changing us by your spirit within us, would you conform us to the image of Christ who gave of himself that we would give to your work in this world for your mission, for your glory, all for the sake of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue in worship this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope
alive in you, Jesus, for an eternity to worship and cry holy. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing a song of ages to the Lamb.
church, fill this room. He's a pray together. Yes, God, you are the one true and living God. You are holy, holy, holy. There is none like you. Before you, no God was formed, and nor shall there be any after you. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and none can compare to you. There is none like you, God. And so when we come this morning, and as a body, we lift our praises and our worship to you. We do so because you are worthy of our worship. You are holy in every way. You are, you are pure in every way. There is none like you. And to think that you would condescend to come to us and to see us in our hopelessness and to see us in our sin and to not leave us there, but to, to win our salvation for us, to ransom us from the slave market of sin and to make us your sons and your daughters and to put your spirit within us and to give us the promise of heaven. God, you have richly blessed us. And so we come with hearts that are full of gratitude and full of praise. You deserve our worship. And now, God, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. God, that you would show us what is in our heart, that you would lead us to life and to peace in you, and that you would help us to understand what you have said, help us to understand our hearts, help us to understand the provision of the cross through Jesus Christ. We need you, we depend upon you and pray that you would do that work in us. And God, for those who are here this morning and who do not know you as their savior, may today be the day that they turn to you in faith. May today be the day that they recognize that they need you, that they need forgiveness of sins, and that they need a restored relationship with you, their creator. Do that for your glory this morning. God, we depend on you for all these things. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, you can go ahead and grab your seat. Well, welcome to Christ Church. We have been blessed already by the, the truths of the gospel that we have sung and that we have prayed together. And uh, now as we open our Bibles and we sit under the ministry of God's word, we will continue to dwell on those same gospel truths. If you're new here, uh, welcome to Christ Church. My name is Jared, and uh, we're glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. And uh, our lead pastor, Adam, has been on sabbatical this summer, but uh, rumor has it that he has begun the process of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> and uh, there have even been some sightings of him, but we're excited to have him back in the pulpit next weekend as we kick off our ministry year. But today, we are going to conclude our series in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. This summer, over the last couple of months, we have been studying the seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And today, we come to the final letter, the letter to the church in Laodicea. And so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up now to Revelation chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one under a seat nearby you, and you can grab that one and head to page 967. That's where you'll find Revelation 3. And if you don't own a Bible, please take that one home as a gift from us to you. Uh, we would love for you to have your own copy of God's Word. So Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14 this morning, as we look at this final letter to the church in Laodicea, we'll pick up there 
in just a moment. Well, I wonder what comes to your mind when you think about the church today and you think about the world that we live in and you think about the challenges and the threats that we face in the world today. And perhaps uh, first you think of the growing secularism that is pushing its way into every corner of our culture. Or maybe you think of the the evolutionary mindset that is continually pushing God out of education. Or maybe you think of the sexual revolution which is attempting to reimagine personhood and reimagine the family. And certainly all of those things are, are significant issues and they demand our attention. But there's a far more dangerous and insidious threat to the church, and it's actually not something out there, it's something in here, it's something within the ranks of the church. One of the greatest threats to the church today and in every age is the threat of spiritual apathy. What makes apathy so dangerous is that it's a silent killer. It sucks the life out of a church and it does so slowly but surely almost undetected. It goes by several names, complacency, indifference, passivity. But no matter what we call it, it's a serious condition. And it's serious because of the spiritual barrenness and the ineffectiveness and the fruitlessness that it produces in the church. We can certainly expect opposition and threats from the outside. Jesus warned that we would face those things. But as soon as the church begins to rot from the inside, as soon as it becomes to become spiritually stagnant, we have a serious problem on our hands. And as Jesus comes to this final letter in uh, the letter to the church in Laodicea, he has this, this concern on his mind. This is certainly not an easy letter. Of the seven letters, this is the only letter without a hint of commendation. Even the hard letter to the church in Sardis at least acknowledged those who had still, the few within that church who had still remained faithful. But here in this letter to Laodicea, there is not even a slight mention of anything worthy of praise and commendation. So, although this letter lacks praise, it certainly, though, does not lack grace. From the beginning to the end, this letter is actually an expression of Jesus' love for the church. It's severe at times, no doubt, but it's ultimately a merciful invitation from the Lord of the church to repent of spiritual apathy and to return to him and to return to a vibrant and a thriving relationship with him. And so as we come to this letter to Laodicea, let's be careful that we are not just coming as onlookers, but that we also come to this letter as inlookers. And certainly within all of us, there are traces of apathy. We've all found ourselves in a slump at one time or another. We've all known what it's like to struggle to pray. We've all known what it's like to be careless about sin at times, to to be content with the spiritual status quo. And maybe that's what you're feeling today. You're feeling some of that in your heart today. And to a degree, we all are. And so we we get Laodicea. We understand them. We're probably more alike than we are different And so as we consider this final letter, let's consider it carefully. Let's pay close attention to the words from the mouth of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. Let's read the letter together, and then we will consider it more closely. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you. 
to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here's the big idea from this passage. You can jot this down, full fellowship. Jesus promises full fellowship to those who overcome spiritual apathy. Jesus promises to reestablish a thriving relationship with anyone who would be honest about their apathy and turn from it. If we're willing to face the mirror and to deal with what we see in the mirror of God's word, Jesus promises to restore and enrich our fellowship with him. And so with that big idea in mind, the key question for us to answer today is how, how do I overcome spiritual apathy? And in this letter to Laodicea, we find four ways to overcome apathy from the mouth of Jesus. Four ways. Let's consider them one at a time as we march our way through this passage. The first way to overcome apathy, I overcome spiritual apathy when I regard the credible voice. Verse 14, Jesus begins this letter as he begins the previous six letters, he begins by identifying himself in a unique way. And what Jesus is doing in each of these letters when he identifies himself in a unique way is he's preparing his readers for what they're about to hear from him. He is explaining to them why he is uniquely qualified to deliver the letter that is about to come. And here in the letter to Laodicea, the first thing that he says in this letter is that these words, this letter contains the words of the amen. Now, where we're familiar with the word amen, it means that we agree with something that has been said. The word amen isn't just Christian uh, code word for the prayer is over. <laughs> the word amen means we agree. Uh, let it be so. May it be. That's what we're saying when we say amen to a prayer. Now, don't miss this though. Jesus here, he doesn't, just, <clears throat> he doesn't just say amen. Jesus is the amen. He claims that this is one of his names. So Jesus doesn't just agree with God. He actually brings God's word into reality. Jesus affirms and certifies the word of God and the promises of God. He validates and he confirms them, which is why Paul, in 2 Corinthians 1.20, he says that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. And, and then he goes on to say, that's why we utter our prayers, our amen through Jesus, is because he is the one in whom we find the yes to God's promises. He laid down his life and he rose triumphant from the grave so that you as a follower of Jesus would know that the promises of God will find fulfillment. His resurrection from the dead is the seal and the promise and the guarantee of all the promises of God. He is the amen. But he says more than that. He says that he is the faithful and true witness. And what he's doing is he's saying something about both his character and his words. He's saying that he is a, a faithful person. His, his character is faithful. And then he says that he is true. His witness or his words are true. And so Jesus here, as he begins this letter, is wanting the Laodiceans to know that he can be trusted. He is reliable. He is credible. In John 14, verse six, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the Jesus who comes to the church in Laodicea. His perspective, his opinion, his words, his sight is perfect, accurate, and credible. And then finally, the last way that he establishes his credibility with this church, look at what he says now. He says he's the beginning of God's Creation. In other words, what he's saying is that he is the sovereign ruler over God's creation. 
Now, you might read those words and you might wonder, is, is Jesus saying that he is part of God's creation? Is that what Jesus means when he says that he is the beginning of God's creation? But that's not actually what he is saying. What he is saying is that he is the originator of God's creation. He isn't the first of God's creation. He is the one who began God's creation. And we see this more clearly in the first chapter of John's gospel. In John chapter one, verses two and three, John says that Jesus was in the beginning with God. And John goes on to say, all things were made through Jesus. And then he says, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. And so John is essentially saying the same thing two different ways. Positively, he says that everything that is made was made by Jesus. And then he says it negatively, and he says that there is nothing that has been made that Jesus didn't make. And so you see, Jesus, Jesus is not the first domino in a long line of dominoes. Jesus is the finger of God that crafted the dominoes and then sets the dominoes in motion at his divine prerogative. That's who Jesus reveals himself to be. And so this is how Jesus introduces himself to a, a droopy and anemic church. He, he means to jolt them out of their sleepy spirituality with the voice of the sovereign creator and ruler. That's how Jesus comes to this church and it's how he comes to us today. He comes with a credible voice and we do well to, to sit up straight and to listen intently and humbly and reverently and obediently to his word. And so what this means for us in our life, one of the ways to overcome apathy in our life is to be sure that the words of Jesus, the credible voice of Jesus is at the center of our life. Every day, give Jesus your ear. Listen intently to Jesus' words. Let him renew your mind. Let him call the shots in your life. That's one of the ways that we can keep ourselves from apathy. And then collectively as a church, how do we at Christ Church keep us as a church from becoming a lukewarm church? How do we prevent ourselves from ever receiving a letter like this one to the church in Laodicea? Well, the answer is simple. We must be resolved to never let any other word stand at the center of this church than the word of Jesus. The moment that any voice begins to ring louder at Christ's church than the voice of Jesus is the moment that the water begins to turn lukewarm at this church. And so we keep Jesus at the center of our life. We keep Jesus at the center of our church. And in that, we guard ourselves against apathy and we overcome the threat of apathy. And so we must regard the credible voice of Jesus. Now let's continue on in this letter and let's see what that credible voice says to Laodicea and what that credible voice says to us today. That brings us to our second point. I overcome spiritual apathy when I heed the clear warning In verses 15 and 16, Jesus directly addresses the issue in Laodicea. What he does is he rebukes them. He rebukes them for being neither hot nor cold. He says, it'd be better if you were one or the other, but you are neither hot nor cold. Now, there's a lot of symbolism in these words, and the Laodiceans would have needed no explanation. They would have known exactly what Jesus was saying right away, but we're not in Laodicea, and so we need a little bit of explanation. What is the significance and the meaning behind this, these figures of speech of hot and cold and lukewarm water? Well, the key to understanding what Jesus is saying here is actually to understand something about the water supply system in Laodicea. So just down the road, about 10 miles east, was a city called Colossae. We're familiar with Colossae. That's the letter of the, the church to the letter, the letter to the ch Colossians. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm not very familiar with it. <laughs> Colossae was just down the road from Laodicea. And what Colossae was known for was their cold, pure drinking water. And so when you see those nice mountain refreshing pictures on the label of your bottled water, 
Think of that, that's Colossae there. That's what Colossae was known for, was their cold Fiji water, okay? <laughs> now, also down the road, six miles to the north was Hierapolis. And this town was known for its hot water springs. It was known for its water that could have gotten up to 95 degrees. And it, what made this water significant is at this time, they believed that that water had healing power to it. And so when you think of Hierapolis, think of your, your neighbor friend who just keeps pestering you about the essential oils that they want to sell to you. <laughs> that was Hierapolis. They believed that this hot water had healing power. And so now with that background in mind, the significance of the hot and the cold water, you can begin to understand what, what Jesus means here. He's saying that the believers in Laodicea should be either like the cold water that brings life and refreshment to the world or like the hot water that brings healing to the world. They should, they should their presence should be a faithful presence in the world that brings grace to the world. But instead, Jesus says that they are lukewarm. And they certainly would have understood the point here because of where they were located in that region Laodicea didn't actually have its own source of water. They didn't have their own water supply. And so they had to bring in the water, that hot water from Hierapolis. They had to bring it into their town by means of an aqueduct. And by the time the water reached Hierapolis, it was dirty and it was tepid and it was disgusting. And that's what they were known for. They were known for having nasty water that people wanted to spit out. I grew up in central California, a town called Visalia, and about 30 minutes west of us was a town called Hanford. And everybody, see, there's a laugh. Somebody knows about Hanford's water. <laughs> Hanford water, it was known for being disgusting. I played water polo in high school, and we always hated it when we were the away team playing Hanford because we had to go to Hanford and swim in their green pool. Hanford was known for their disgusting water. Well, Laodicea is known for their disgusting water. It was tepid, it was hard. It was dirty by the time it got to them. And Jesus compares their spirituality to that water. Their faith is distasteful and nearly useless. He rebukes them for their lack of zeal, for not offering life and healing to their community. He, he rebukes them for the spiritual barrenness of their church. And then he comes to the warning in verse 16. He says, I will spit you out of my mouth. These are strong words from Jesus. Actually, probably the most literal translation is the word vomit. And this is no small matter to Jesus. It's a dire situation, and he wants them to feel the gravity of it. He simply can't stomach the lukewarm water of apathy in the church. Now, I love being a parent, and I know that uh, as parents, we're supposed to enjoy every unique season, right? Don't try to rush through, enjoy every unique season. But there are simply some things in parenting that are incapable of being enjoyed. If you've ever had young kids, you know what I'm talking about. Changing diapers, of course, is one of them. Changing car seats is one of the things that I hate the most. Lugging around a pack and play, setting it up and tearing it down. These are the things that sometimes I daydream about them being in the past. <laughs> but there's one thing that got me thinking about this, and it's the perennial challenge of getting your kids to eat their food. Somehow they can eat cartons of goldfish in kids' ministry, but they can't eat a serving of rice pilaf. <laughs> now, as parents, though, we... We could just take the easy route and we could serve them goldfish every meal, but we're actually trying to raise them to be adult functioning human beings. And so what we have to do is we have to teach them how to swallow even when it's something that they don't want to eat. Well, when it comes to the spiritual condition of Laodicea, Jesus simply cannot stomach the apathy. He is unwilling to just grin and bear it. He refuses to acquire a taste for it. And here's why. There's a reason why this is so distasteful to Jesus. It's not just because of the spiritual barrenness and unfruitfulness. It's not, that, it's not just that they aren't bringing grace to the world. It's also because lukewarm Christianity tells the world a lie about the gospel. 
It tells the world that the gospel doesn't actually transform people. It tells the world that the gospel has no good effect on the world. And more than that, it not just tells, doesn't just tell a lie about the gospel, it tells a lie about Jesus himself. Lukewarm Christianity says to the world that Jesus is kind of worthy of our devotion. It says to the world that Jesus is important, but he's not as important as some things. Jesus will have nothing to do with this kind of Christianity because it misrepresents him and it misrepresents the gospel. In Isaiah 42, 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Jesus will not forfeit his glory to anything. And when we live apathetic and lukewarm lives, we're communicating to the world that he is not worthy of our full devotion. So here is the warning. Now, how do we heed this warning from Jesus? Well, one day that we heed the warning from Jesus is we redeem the time. As Paul says in Ephesians 5, 16, redeem the time. And a couple things can help us here. And the first is to realize that life is short, to keep that reality in front of you often. Life is short. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And I could adapt that to say, teach us to number our days so that we might live a life of full devotion to God. With all the medicine and the healthcare and the anti-aging products and the biohacking that money can buy, we actually can begin to believe the lie that we won't die. But the reality is, is that death is coming for all of us. And the more that we live with this realization, the more we will live with urgency, the more we will live with zeal to reach the lost and to faithfully live a life that counts for eternity. One of Jonathan Edwards' uh, famous resolutions was this. He said, resolved to think much on all occasions of what? Of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. Now that kind of sounds morbid. It kind of is morbid, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. That's actually one of the healthiest things that we can do because it reminds us that that reality of death is coming for all of us. No one will escape that reality. It reminds us that life is short and it keeps us from getting comfortable in this life. And so this is one way to fight apathy and to fan into flame a passion for the work of the Lord. Another way that we can fight this is to, to remind ourselves that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus actually did this for the church in Philadelphia last week. We studied that letter. Jesus reminded them he is coming soon. And what that was meant to do for them and for us and for all Christians of all ages is it's meant to, it's meant to instill in us urgency. It's meant to radically impact the way that we live. Jesus intends for us to live with urgency and determination. We don't know when he's coming back, but we do know that he is coming back, and we want to be found serving him faithfully and tirelessly, seeking to win the lost and bringing grace to this world. Amy Carmichael was a missionary to India for 55 years, and she said this. She said, I would rather burn out than rust out. Jesus is coming soon. May we be busy reaching the world for him and bringing grace to the world while we await his return. Now, let me speak a quick word before we move on to those who are here today and they don't know Jesus as their savior. Although this is primarily a warning to God's people, there's also a word for you in this passage as well. Every moment that God gives you in this life is a moment of mercy. There is coming a day when God will judge mankind, a day of irreversible rejection, when he will spew out of his mouth those who remain stubbornly indifferent toward him. But dear friend, 
That day has not yet come. And if you will heed the clear warning of Jesus, bow your knee to him and repent of indifference and apathy toward him and humbly receive him as your Lord and Savior, the promise of the gospel is that he will have you. He will save you. And he will give you a heart that burns with passion and zeal for him. Today is the day of salvation. Turn to Jesus. Find life in him before it's too late. Now let's move on to our third point. Those who belong to Jesus, they can overcome apathy by regarding his credible voice, by heeding his clear warning. And now third, I overcome spiritual apathy by accepting the generous offer. When I accept the generous offer. In verses 17 through 19, Jesus he corrects their delusional thinking in these verses, the, the delusional thinking that had led to apathy, and then he makes a generous offer to them that they would be foolish to refuse. The first thing he does is correct their thinking. Look at verse 17. He says, for you say, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, Laodicea was no doubt a prosperous city, they had three lucrative industries in Laodicea, wool, medicine, and banking. And through these industries, they had become one of the wealthiest and one of the most important commercial centers in that region. But see, the problem in Laodicea was not actually their wealth. The problem is that they had become self-sufficient in their wealth. They took their business success to be an indication of their spiritual well-being, and when they stepped back and they looked at their life and they saw everything that they had and the money that they had, they stepped back and they thought, we're doing all right. And that bred indifference and apathy in them. But Jesus, Jesus actually sees things differently. He says that spiritually speaking, he says that they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, they were, they were confused. They had confused their material wealth for spiritual health. And when we confuse things that are similar but radically different, the consequences can be significant. If you're an amateur in the kitchen like me, then you've probably had the experience of reaching for baking powder and instead grabbing baking soda. <laughs> and that's one quick way to ruin your cinnamon rolls. <laughs> you might reach into the cupboard, the medicine cabinet, and grab a bottle, but if you grab the wrong one, it can have detrimental consequences. Well, the Christians in Laodicea made a tragic mistake. They thought that their material wealth was an indication of their spiritual health. They had begun to confuse financial position and spiritual condition. And what happens when you make this mistake is that life begins to become more pragmatic than spiritual. Life begins to become a pursuit of more comfort in this life rather than a deeper spirituality and love for the Lord. Life becomes more about material gain than about spiritual depth. And when this happens, you have a recipe for a serious spiritual problem. You have a recipe for apathy and stagnation. And so what does Jesus do to help Laodicea. What does he offer them to clear up their confusion and to root out their apathy? What Jesus does to Laodicea is he actually, he holds out to them and he offers them true health, wealth, and prosperity. He helps them to turn from the counterfeit by offering the real thing. And in short, what Jesus does is he offers himself to them. Verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. During my college summers, I had the distinct honor and privilege of being a Cutco knife salesman. <laughs> if you've ever received a call from a young, ambitious college student and he wants you to give him an hour of your time so he can do a knife demo because he knows your friend's coworker's friend, I'm sorry, I was one of those guys. But one thing that I learned in my summer of selling Cutco knives is that if you want to be a successful salesperson, you have to believe in what you're selling. 
You have to believe that you actually have something of value. If you don't believe that you actually have something to offer, then they're not going to believe and they're not going to buy. Now, I hesitate to compare Jesus to a salesman, but make no mistake, Jesus is selling in verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me. He has assets of infinite value and they are available to whosoever will come and take them. He wholeheartedly believes in what he is selling. He knows that these things are exactly what his people need and that they are far better than anything that this world can offer. What he offers them in this passage is he offers them the spiritual counterpart to those three lucrative industries. He offers them the spiritual counterpart to their wool and their banking and their medicine. He says, you think you've got banking? Bankroll, buy from me the true riches of pure joy that are found in treasuring me and prizing me and loving me above all else. You think that your medicine and eye salve give true healing? Buy from me salve that will heal your blindness and will give you eyes to see things that bring lasting transformation and true healing. You think that your wool is all that you need? Buy from me the white garments of my righteousness to cover your shame and your spiritual nakedness. That's what Jesus is offering to him and to them. Now, there's a, there's a paradox here in this verse, though. Jesus has just said that the Laodiceans are poor, but now he, he counsels them to buy from him gold. Now, how, how does that work? And the answer lies in the fact that, that God's economy is different. In God's economy, the only currency that matters is need. One commentator says, the coin of the realm is desperation. We don't pay him out of our resources, but from an acknowledgement of the depths of our abject poverty. The price God requires is that faith in him, which humbly concedes that one has nothing with which to bargain, nothing with which to trade, nothing with which to make so much as a meager down payment. Now, maybe this reminds you of one of the most beautiful invitations from God in the Bible. Isaiah 55, verse one, God invites his people. He says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. The only currency that counts is need. The coin of the realm is desperation. Now, I I hope that that you hear in this passage, although this is a hard letter, I hope that you hear the love of God in this. God loves his people enough to say hard things and then to call them back to himself, to woo them back to himself. He says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Repent. He wants nothing more than what is best for them. And that's why he's willing to say the hard thing to call them out of lethargy and into a vibrant life and zeal and passion for him, a life of diligence and wholeheartedness. This is the good life. And Jesus knows it, and he will stop at nothing to see that his people experience it. Now, what does it look like to accept this generous offer? How do we receive the offer that Jesus holds out to us? And it begins with getting deadly honest about where you've become self-sufficient and forgetful of your need for the Lord. And then in a recognition of that, then resolving to live in constant and desperate dependence on him. Jesus calls this abiding in John 15. That's what, that's what Jesus Uh, describes there as we are like a, a branch that is drawing life and spiritual strength from the vine. To abide in Jesus is to live in constant dependence upon him. Apart from him, Jesus says, apart from him, we can do nothing. But abiding in him and accepting all that he generously offers, this is the way to overcome apathy and to live a fruitful life for him. Now, when we accept that offer, there is an incredible benefit that Jesus holds out to us. That brings us to the fourth and final way to overcome apathy. 
I overcome spiritual apathy when I embrace the incredible benefit. In these final <clears throat> three verses, Jesus gives us two pictures, and these pictures represent uh, the promise of full fellowship, full and vibrant fellowship with him. The first picture is in verse 20. It's a picture of Jesus entering a home to enjoy table fellowship with his people. Jesus says to anybody who responds to his knock, to anybody who hears his credible voice and opens the door, Jesus promises he will come in and he will eat with them. This is a promise of intimate fellowship and companionship with Jesus. Jesus doesn't picture himself here as a homeless man who's knocking on your door just hoping that you're gonna open and let him in. Jesus doesn't picture himself here as a landlord who's angry, pounding on your door to ask for the rent. Jesus presents himself here as a friend to his people, a friend who hasn't heard from his people in a while. They've stopped returning his call. And rather than in anger turning from them, Jesus comes to them. He seeks them out. He knocks on their door and he says, if you will open the door, I will come in and I will restore fellowship with you. And then the second picture, it's in verse 21. It's a picture of Jesus sharing his throne with his people. He says, to the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers unbelief, to the one who conquers all the things that, that threaten our spiritual health, including the threat of apathy, to the one who conquers, he says, I will let him reign with me. I will share my throne with him. One of the ways that you know that a relationship that was once broken has been restored is that the people in that relationship begin to once again share with each other the things that are most valuable to them. Children who are reconciled, they begin to share their toys with each other again. Friends who are reconciled, they begin to share their valuable time with each other. Spouses who are restored to each other, they begin to share themselves with each other again. And here, Jesus promises to those who conquer and overcome all the spiritual assault of this world, he promises to share his throne with them, to let them co-reign with him just as he reigns with his father. And so what these two pictures of the table and the throne represent is they represent the incredible benefit of fellowship with Jesus. Promise of fellowship for those who overcome and the promise of the gospel is that through faith in Jesus, you have everything that you need to overcome. First John 5, 5 says, who is it that overcomes the world? except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Now, sometimes apathy is a result of distraction. Sometimes our affections drift from the Lord. We give our heart to money or family or career or sports or house. And when we do that, there's nothing left for the one who deserves everything from us. And what Jesus is saying is when you find yourself there, remember the incredible benefit that your Savior holds out to you, that if you will open the door, he'll come in to have fellowship with you, that if you will overcome and conquer, he promises to share his throne with you. So when the distractions of this world threaten to suck the life out of you and to steal your passion for the Lord, remember Remember the words of Psalm 1611, in your presence, O God, in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Turn from apathy, turn to the Lord and embrace the incredible benefit of fellowship with him because nearness to the Lord will leave no room for apathy in your heart. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As I came in yesterday, God put a song on my heart. It's an oldie but a goodie, and I hope we'll never stop singing this song. You guys know this song. Give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. 
Give me one glorious ambition for my life, to know and follow hard after you, to grow as your disciple in your truth. This world is empty, pale, and poor compared to knowing you, my Lord. Lead me on, and I will run after you. God, I pray that you would lead us on, that you would draw us back into fellowship with you. Lord, there is nothing better. There is nothing greater. There is nothing more satisfying, nothing more thrilling than to know fellowship with you. Lord, it is so easy for us to forget. It is so easy for us to drift. It is so easy for us to become indifferent. And so God, we confess today where we see apathy in our heart, we confess it to you, God. And even as we confess it, we take great comfort and delight in knowing that you are a God who forgives and you are a God who restores. And so we pray you would restore to us the joy of our salvation, restore to us a right spirit within us, restore to us passion and zeal for you. Lord, this is what we want. Would you do that in us? We know that we desperately need you to do it. We depend upon you. Give us the strength to repent and to be zealous. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the reasons why we can gladly and willingly lay down our lives for Jesus is because Jesus first laid down his life for us. And so this is an opportunity now as we share in the bread and the cup to remember the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. Our team's gonna go ahead and start serving the elements now. There's two cups. Be sure you take both cups. The bread is on the bottom. The juice is on the top. And what this is, as we take the bread and the cup, is an opportunity for us to remember what Jesus did. It is so easy in the distractions of this life to forget. There's nothing more important than the gospel, nothing more important than the cross, but it's easy to forget. And so the bread and the cup bring us back, and they remind us of what Jesus has done on our behalf. It's also an opportunity for us to repent, to turn from sin. The cross and the blood broke the power of sin in us, so we have the power within us through the spirit of Jesus to turn from sin. So this is an opportunity to resolve in our heart to turn from sin, even as we rejoice, because we know that the work is finished. We know that there's nothing that we have to do to add to the work of Jesus. When he cried out, it is finished, he meant for us to hear those words and to rest in those words. So as the team sings over us, let's reflect on the work of Jesus on our behalf.
1 Corinthians 11, 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant that would purchase our salvation, the new covenant that would purchase the Holy Spirit to live in us, the new covenant that would make us a new creation in Christ. This is my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand together. Before we go out, let's sing of our dependence upon the Lord. When I pass through death as I enter Help us, God. I depend on you Lord, I depend on you for eternal life to be raised with Christ. I depend on you. Lord, I depend on you. You're the way, the truth, and the light. You're the will that never can be all kinds of reasons why you experience spiritual apathy. Maybe you're experiencing spiritual apathy because you've never actually put your trust in Jesus Christ. You are not walking by faith with him today. We have a team out in the lobby at what's called the hub. It's a carpeted area in between the double doors. If you want to know what it means to follow Jesus, or if you have other questions about that, don't leave without talking to them and getting your questions answered so that you can live for Jesus. Maybe you're experiencing spiritual apathy because you're carrying burdens that have taken your eyes off of Jesus. Our team is up here on each side of the stage and they would love to pray with you over those things before you leave here today. But whatever's going on, let's not live in spiritual apathy. Let's conquer in the name of Jesus by the spirit of God in us as we live with